So the word is restoration. Restore 2024. I think God is very pleased with that. He's in love with rest. Jesus was a carpenter. He was a builder. He rebuilt things. And wow, it's an exciting time. It was always an exciting time when the temple was, well, after it had been destroyed, that it was being rebuilt and renewed. And, and the foundation was laid and they had a big celebration. It's a good thing when we see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. It means the building. And in, in any kind of building, it's really exciting when you see a new shopping center. <laughs> that excites me. And you see the ground breaking, and it's all oh, TJ Maxx is coming. It's an exciting thing. But all oh, with the house of God, it's being restored. And the things that have been lost and taken away in Babylonian captivity. And the enemy tries to put the, the church in the grave. But all oh, she rises up again. And that's restoration. That's what we're right in the middle of. Exciting, exciting time. So pastor read from Joel 2 and 25. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the crawling locusts, the consuming locusts, and the chewing locusts, my great army, which I sent among you. The locusts. You know, they, they eat little, they're little, they're, they're bugs, but, and they take little bites, but over time, it takes everything away. And so in this time of years, things have been eaten and taken away from the house of God, the people of God. And they are not relying on God anymore. They, they're relying on other things. Their own understanding is what they're leaning on. And they've learned how to do church. So the locusts have eaten, and this is a revelation. I know I'm reading scripture, but I'm going to throw this revelation that the Lord gave me about, about locusts. Because he says, you know, he starts with that, but I will restore the years that the, the locusts have eaten, and the canker worm and the palmer worm have eaten. And um, so up until the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom suffered violence. That means passivity. And that's what happens in time time things rust a car will rust that needs restored it'll get holes in it decay happens but when restoration comes so here up until the days of John the Baptist the kingdom suffered violence the violent but then the violent began to take it by force so we were passive things we lost things but now he said, I will restore the years of the canker worm and the palmer worm and the locusts have eaten. And I'm going to pour my spirit out. And that's what happened with Elizabeth and Mary while they were pregnant with Jesus and John. And restoration began. And it began with a wild man in animal skin and eating locusts. And the Lord told me, he said, when restoration began to step on the scene, the devourer that was, that, that the thing, the locust, that John, restoration was devouring, eating locusts and honey, the devourer. That's the way he came in on the scene of this new restoration. This, God is always doing a new thing. He's doing a new thing. He's making it brand new. He's renewing, restoring homes, marriages, houses, his house. That's the restoration in the name of Jesus. Isaiah 58 and 12. And they, that's us, that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called. These are what God calls us, the, his restorers. The repairer of the breach and the restorer of paths to dwell in. So that's us, repairers of the breach. 
a breach is a gap, decay. I talked about it in first service, so Pastor Richard has made this beautiful display so that we can see and have a picture of what God's going to do in this church and in our lives and in our families and in our city and in our country and in our world in the last days. Restoration. So when a car gets rusty, you can't paint it. It'll, it'll get a hole. And that hole will grow. And, and so restoration is needed in taking out things. So the breach, repair of the gap, the gap that has been created by decay between us and God. That's what repairs of the breach are. The restore of paths to dwell in. Restore is return to. Return to God. I have somewhat against you. You have left your first love. Jeremiah, you're getting away from me. Return to me and separate the precious, the word of truth from the lie. And then you'll be my mouthpiece. But return to me. I will give them a heart to know me and they will return to me. And I will be their God and they will be my people. They will return to me with their whole heart. So restorer is to return. Make it new. Make it shiny new. Make it better than ever. And return. So what does it look like? I'm going to give you the end. I'm going to lay out the, the blueprint of our restoration project. This is what it looks at the end. Isn't it cool that I can give you the end at the beginning? Because then that, that builds excitement. What's the end product going to look like? We can find it in Isaiah 61, 1 and 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Now, I love this because this is, Isaiah is speaking this prophetically about if this is the coming of the Messiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. And he has sent me to bind up brokenhearted. So, you know, we remember the scene in the Bible where Jesus goes in the temple and he says, Hand me the scroll in the book of Isaiah. And that, that he goes, and, it, and here it's a scroll. It's got all these... It's not, where did he find it? But he, oh, he opens right up to this passage and he begins to read this. And the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. And he sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them, here it is, here's the end, the end result, beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might, they, that's us, might be called trees righteousness the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified and they shall build the waste the old waste and they shall raise up former desolations are you ready to start this work and they shall repair the waste cities and the desolations of many generations. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I pray that you anoint me and that you speak to our hearts. Lord, I can't do this without you and I don't want to. God, I need your help. I don't want to speak one word that you don't want me to speak and I don't want to miss a word that you want me to speak. Lord, touch our ears, our hearts, our minds, God. And, and, and let us receive the word so that we will leave different than we came in. And that you will do an eternal work and you will prepare us for this wonderful restoration project that you are right in the middle of. Bless us. Bless your word. And thank you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I have that. You may be seated in, in my notes so that I wouldn't make you stand forever. But I kind of made you stand forever. So I'm sorry about that.
Okay, I'm going to read. I have a lot of words, so just bear with me. I, I didn't want you to stand up for more words, so I let you sit down. Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, with two covering his face, and with two covering his feet, and with two he did fly. And one cried to another, and they said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. So I've heard some ministers say, and it's, it's a good way to say this, in the year that King Uzziah died, and they'll stop there and they'll say the year that pride died, the year that man's way died, when men get good ideas that aren't God ideas, and when they take the seat that belongs to God in his temple, and they take it instead of him. But here, when pride died, this prideful king, suddenly the seat is open to the, the rightful owner of it. And it says that the robe of the train of his robe fills the temple. That's restoration of spiritual things. When they get watered down and they get decay and they get, they get old. So that scene is a very important one. We'll be going back to that one. So I love a good renovation and, a, and, and renovation or restoration. Now, re restoration and renovation, they're two different things. But um, old or new, I'll say something that I'll say a little later. You know, we just have to do it God's way. You know, he has specific orders. There are specific things that you can't live like the world. You can't love the world. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. So you can't bring that into the house. You can't bring sins into the house. So, um, but I love a good restoration project. I have a miter saw and I know how to use it. <laughs> and I think I got that from my daddy because he restores stuff. And Pastor Ray had mentioned that. Our daddy loves it and I don't even know how he does it, but he makes it old messy layers of pain and he will restore it back to its original state that's what restoration is restoring back giving us back returning back to god repairing the things that have been decayed so i'm watching this parish on instagram it's being restored um they found it it was a, built by a, i guess a pastor who built the church, and then he built the parish, which we would call a, like a parsonage. And the, the house was in ruins, and it was going to be demolished. And this guy said, I can't let this happen. I want to rebuild this house. So they go in the house, and it is a mess. And he's like, what have I done? He, he bought it without seeing it. But he goes inside, and it is in ruins. And there's dirt and decay, and walls have crumbled, and they are in the floor and they show the one of the first videos where they're pulling all that debris out and um so demolition is needed there there you have to first step of a of a restoration project is to take out all of the decay and the dirt before you can build new and restore it so um i also love to watch Chip and Joanna Gaines, and they love to renovate and restore. She likes to buy antiques, and she'll restore old doors and windows and things back to their original state. And her husband, Chip, he is the muscles behind it. He is the one that tears everything out and rebuilds it. And um, they refer to this as Demo Day. And he gets excited. They've done it several times. Oh, this is Chip's favorite day, demo day. He loves to tear it all apart and carry it out. 
And uh, so I'm going to do this whole thing. So in the process of, in the process of this restoration project, today is officially demo day. When I asked Doug to get it, I said, do they have small ones? No, no, no. You got the picture. Today's demo day. Don't want to break the glass. We're not doing that kind of demo today. So. And I don't want you to be afraid. I'm not going to hurt you. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens and he corrects. And if he doesn't, the Bible says we are illegitimate children. We are not his. So now in this restoration project, we have to fix what we did wrong. And we have to be corrected and do it God's way. And uh, let me see, what else was I going to read? I have to read this because we read this in our staff meeting. And Mike, you'll like this. You'll love this. Um, so we're in a fast as a church. But in Isaiah 58, the Lord talks about the fast that he likes, the fast that he has chosen. Cry aloud and spare not, Isaiah 58, 1. Lift up the voice like a trumpet and show the people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Now, they're not talking about the people. They're talking about the leaders. They seek me daily and not that this is our leaders. This is going to help us help other churches. This is going to help us help God's house, the big one, and build his kingdom. Yet they seek me daily, and they delight to know my ways as a nation, and they did right at, that did righteousness, and forsook not the ordinance of God. They ask me the ordinances of justice. They delight in approaching God. They love to approach God. Therefore, have, wherefore have we fasted, they say, and, they, and thou seest not. Wherefore have, I, have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast, you will find your own pleasure and you exact all your labors. You put heavy burdens on the people, burdens too heavy to bear. Behold, you fast for strife and debate and smite your fists with wickedness. You're going to hell. <laughs> you know, that hard line, you know. The Lord told me one time, he said, he said, don't do that. Don't say, you're going to hell. Say, don't go to hell. Don't go to hell. You know, this is how you don't go to hell. Obey God. Do it his way. But don't go to hell. But he said that you fast so that your voice will be heard on high. Is this the fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day of the Lord? Is this not the fast that I have chosen? Now we get his fast. What is the fast, Lord, that you have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free. And that ye break every yoke. Is this not to deal bread to the hungry? And that thou bring the poor that are cast out into the house. And that thou seest the naked and you cover him. And that you hide not yourself from your own flesh. And he said this, he said, Then your light will break forth as the morning. And your health shall spring forth speedily. 
and thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall you be your re reward. If, I'm just going to jump down, if you will take away from the midst of you the yoke and the putting forth of the finger. And this is what we think sometimes think ministry is. Just telling people what they should do and what they shouldn't do. But then <laughs> there is the, the end of the restoration process and, and the oil of joy from morning. The oil that reminds of the anointing that breaks the yoke. It all comes from God and we can learn how to do ministry and, and get comfortable and casual with it and throw the baby out with bathwater and forget the power that we need. Is it 1 Timothy 3.1? Know this also in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Reminds me of when uh, um, Paul stood before the Galatians and he said, who has bewitched you? Who has spooked you? What spirit has got into you? He's talking to the Galatians that you can take what you began in the spirit and now somehow you think that you have it all down and now you can make it perfect in the flesh. And the Lord spoke to me years ago. He said, there is a lust for ministry and not a love for God and his kingdom. And he said that to me because he's going to guard me from it. And he gave me a, a, a something I could go by as a guideline to not fall into a lust of ministry. And he said, he gave me the, the 1 Corinthians 13 uh, love definition. Love is patient, love is kind, it doesn't envy, doesn't boast, it's not proud, rude, self-seeking, not easily angered, doesn't keep records of wrong, rejoices in the truth, doesn't rejoice in things that are not the truth, always hopes, always perseveres, love never fails. Always hopes, always trusts, always perseveres. Love never fails. He said, take that definition of love. And if you want to recognize a lust for ministry, turn it to the opposite. It's impatient, unkind, self-seeking. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. That's the scripture. Do nothing to bring a light to yourself. You don't belong in that seat. There's only one person that belongs in that seat. And I'm, I'm going to share a story with you that I shared. I actually have like four stories and only got to share one in the first service. So I probably have to speed up my talking. So, so I'll just speed talking so that I can get through all of them because they're great, wonderful experiences. And, and I talked to you about chastening and how important correction, the correction of the Lord is. It says, do not despise the correction of the Lord. He does that for your protection. And if we're not corrected, we're not his. We don't belong to him. We're illegitimate children. So the correction of the Lord marks me as his. So when I got a calling on my life, I was at Potter's house. I was a, a youth leader for seven years before I became the youth pastor. And um, in between, there was an interim in between that. And um, three months that I got to sit in, fill in. And I'm telling you, the whole time that I was a youth leader, I sat in the back and the Lord would pour into me things that I wanted to tell them, that I wanted to minister to them. And uh, the person that was in place quit, left, time to get a new person. And they let me 
be an interim person in between that time. But this is not the seven years. This is in the middle of it. So I'm like, thank the Lord I got to pour into him. I put him in a circle and we had talks and, and the Lord gave me messages and, and he anointed me and I knew it and I thought, wow, I love this. This is awesome. This is awesome. But they're not looking for me to hire me either. I'm just a fill-in. But I said, Lord, how, how will I get them to know that I have something. And if they don't see it, the staff there, the pastor there, if they don't see it, then I'll never get to do anything for you. And you have called me to ministry. And, and they'll never see it. And I remember walking down the hall one day and the Lord said, why do you seek favor from men when you have it with me? And then, you know, then the correction started. And I don't know about you, but I love it when the Lord corrects me. Don't confuse condemnation with correction. Because correction is beautiful. And it's in love. And it's peaceable. And it's easily entreated. It is God. And it is wonderful. It's not the putting forth of the finger and putting burdens on you and saying, you better live right. None of us can live right. if We don't have God. So here I am interim. And I love, my brother was a uh, youth pastor of Oasis. This was many years ago. And I was in my 20s, a young mom. And I invited him to come because I was asking him all the questions. He's like, he's the youth pastor guru and the best, the best in my book. So he comes in and speaks to them a message that is flat out amazing. And, and it, it is wonderful. And when, when it was over and he left, a lady, one of, one of my youth leader workers, helpers, she came to me and she goes, that's the best message these kids have ever heard. And I was like, what am I, chopped liver? <laughs> and and I, it hurt me. And then the enemy came in and he goes, you never do nothing because they don't know what you have. They're not going to ever see it or recognize it. And I was like, I felt awful. And it's like I was, I was depressed. And I was sad. When you're depressed and you're sad and you know you're listening to the wrong voice. And so I'm sad and I'm having a big pity party. And the Lord, correcting Lord, steps in and he goes, stop choking on it. Swallow it. Receive it. You're nothing. And I got this silly grin on my face. Because I know what happened. I just stepped into a father-daughter situation. I just stepped in to a God moment. So I got a silly grin on my face and I said, yes, Lord, that is right. And I receive it. I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to humble me. And I humble myself before you. And at that same time, I was studying about King Uzziah and, and how he, when he died and his pride died, that then the seat was opened in the house of the Lord and God was able to sit in it. And, I'm, and, I, and I prayed that for my church. I said, Lord, if any man gets in your seat, get him out. I want you in that seat and I want your train to fill the temple. Take your rightful seat. Well, see, now he's, he's teaching me to not take it from him. So I am like, I got the silly grin on my face and I always go to the extreme. So I'm like, Lord, let me be the girl at the dance that nobody wants to dance with. Let me be the wallflower that disappears into the wallpaper. Let me be the person on the team. You know, those two teams and you're always sweating and waiting. You know, I was really skinny and no one ever picked me. And I said, Lord, let me be the person on the team that no one picks. Let me disappear. I want to disappear. I want to get out of your way. <laughs> and in the middle of saying that, he was so pleased. And he said this. He said, you know, you've been praying about the seat. He said, now that you have decreased, I can increase. And I saw the chair in my mind, and I saw him sit down in his house. 
and his robe. And the train from his robe began to just fall into the house until it filled the temple. And we know that scene with the seraphims crying, holy, holy, holy. That's what he wants in every house that people have built him in this nation. And in the last days, we need him to take his rightful seat and we don't need to take it from him. It's not about us. You know, when people have a lust for ministry, it's about them, position, title. You know, they forget that we're servants of the Lord, that it's all about him. And that we don't find, we should not find value in what we do, but of who we know. And I got this from the millennial thousand year question that determines where you will be 1,000 years from now. And it, 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 um, and it comes down to the question that the Lord will ask, do I know you? Do I know you? Because it says, Manny will say, Lord, Lord. And he said, depart from me. I, who are you? I don't know you. We, we know him by coming into the fellowship of his sufferings. We know him because we are Christians and we are crucified with Christ. We no longer live, but Christ lives in us. And it's in him that we live and move and have our being. And anything else is decaying rust and garbage. And it replaces the treasure of the house with filth and garbage. That takes me to uh, Old Testament demolition day, demo day. We'll say demo day. Second Chronicles 29, 1 and 6. Hezekiah began to reign. And he was five and 20 years old. And he reigned nine and 20 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Ab Abinai. That sounds good. I'll go with that. The daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. According to all that David his father had done. And he in the first year of his reign. In the first month opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And repaired them. The doors of the house of the Lord were repaired. He's on the right track. Restoration is beginning. The things that have been decayed and rotten and terrible, they're being restored. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east street. He brought in the ministers. And he said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify yourself and sanctify the house of the Lord, God your fathers, and carry forth the filthiness out of this holy place. That's sanctification. That's demo day. That's let's get the, the, the fluff out. The things that don't work, the things that are formed with no power. Let's return to the Lord. I have someone against you. You've left your first love. Return and do your first works over. That's how you get restored. You do it over again. You do what you did in the beginning over and you make new. And he said, that's all, that's all you have to do. Carry forth the filth out of the holy place. I gave the scripture of what the end process of restoration looks like. What does the beginning look like? Well, it looks like probably that parish that is in rubble. You know, the beginning looks bad. Things are bad. But that's okay because God can make them good. Uh, the end result is decay, a loss of God, a loss of the treasures in the house. We replace them with garbage. And then God, that he knows we need in order to live an abundant life. What does total loss and, and look and sound like? 2 Timothy 3, 1, 5. Know this also, that in the last days perilous times will come, and men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, 
Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. And that, welcome to 2024. Welcome to church 2024. You know, people, we've, we've let things go. We get complacent and we get tired. We get weary. We get weary of fighting people like I was telling Pastor Richard, you know, that the, we're in the last days. The Bible said many will be offended. So now we have all these people that are, you touch them the wrong, look at them the wrong way, and they're explosive, and they're mad, and they're upset, and they're offended. Jesus said in John, he said, he said, they will take you and throw you out, into, out of the synagogue and think they do God's service. They're not working for me, but they'll do that to you. And he said, I'm saying this so that you won't be offended. Don't be offended. Know that you're doing what I'm telling you to do. You're going to suffer persecution, but it's okay. It doesn't mean that you're doing the wrong thing. It actually means you're doing the right thing. Don't be offended. So we got all these people offended. And they want us to pacify them and pamper them and give them what they want and tell them what they want to hear. And what they need is correction. So then I call it minefield ministry. We're, we're approaching. Hold on, Pastor Richard. I'm coming upon an offended person. I got to make sure this mine doesn't explode, <laughs> you know. But yet the gospel works and love works. Love never fails, you know. And so, so we put the pointing finger and the heavy burdens, we put... We put it away and we love them to Jesus. That's what ministry is. It's loving people to Jesus. That's what restoration and returning to his love. Dependency on him. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Getting back what we lost. So then pastor read the scripture from Joel for the call of a solemn assembly. And that's how it begins. We have to say, wait a minute, maybe we're doing something wrong. We're supposed to do, feed the hungry, clothe the naked. We're supposed, and that's an awesome thing. It's a perfect time in our restoration process to do shalom and to feed people and to clothe them and sit and talk with them and Love on them and love them to Jesus. That's how you win people. So we get to do that. So gather the people. This is from Joel. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing babies. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Let the priests and the ministers to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O God, and do not give your inheritance to reproach that the nations may rule over them. That they won't say, where is your God? Now, Joel 1 and 5. Awake, you drunkards, and weep and howl, all you drinkers of wine, because the new wine, for it has been cut off from your mouth. Gird yourselves and lament, you priests. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come and lie at night in sackcloth, you ministers, to, the, to God. For the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. So they've acknowledged that they've lost something. And they want it back. Otherwise, they wouldn't weep and howl and lament like a virgin that, whose fiancé has died, is what that means. Weep on that level and that degree. I don't care if you had a baby. I don't care if you're going to have a baby. I don't care if you're planning a wedding. It says drop what you're doing and come and seek the Lord and let's get back what we have lost. I have too many pages and my brother would be upset. He tells me, you can't do that. You can't have all these pages. Um, so I'm going to tell another story because I didn't get to tell the other story. 
But I want to tell you correction stories because I love them and I love the correction of the Lord. I certainly don't despise it. I want to be made like him. You know, I want to be like David when he said, search me, oh God. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me to life everlasting. I want to do it right. I want to live right. I want him. I want him. And he knows I want him. And I love him. And, and I don't, you know, that's what he, when we did the millennial question, you know, where will you be a, a thousand years from now? All depends on, do you know him? We know him, that I may know him through the fellowship of his sufferings and the resurrection of his power. Being conformable to his death. You know, that's that we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the power and the excellency would be of him and not us. So we have these bad things that happen, but we are suffering. We are partakers of Christ suffering with him. And that so that life begins to happen. So, do we know him? That's the important thing. It's not about what you do, but it's about who you know. On that day, when you stand before the Lord, the question will be, do I know him? It's not about what you do. It's about who you know and how well you know him. So, again, I was studying, and I studied about the temple. And then we'll go back to the temple again, where... Um, the priest and Aaron, they had to wear breeches. Maybe I should say breeches. They had to wear breeches. Is it breeches? <laughs> breeches. Under their robe so that they wouldn't die. That's what it says. It says they cover themselves, even though it's under the robe, so they wouldn't die when they stood before an almighty, powerful God. So, um, let me back up a little and just talk about the cart. They, David was so excited they got the ark and they brought it back into the camp and they were so excited, but they got it from the Philistines and the Philistines had it on a cart. Now the Philistines, nothing happened to them because they didn't know better, but the glory of God had to be handled in a specific way. So they're all excited and it starts to wobble because it's in a carriage the people that cared for the ark didn't have any carriages. They bore it on their shoulders because that's the way God said to do it. But they put it on a cart. It wobbled. Uzzah put his hand there, and he died. And now David's mad. God, why did you do that? We're, we're, this is a good thing. And, and, and Matthew Henry says, whether the cart was new or old, it was not how God appointed it. And that they treated it as a common thing by just putting it on a cart. Don't let us treat the glory of God as a common thing. So I'm, I'm studying about the breaches and the breaches or whatever it is. And I'm like, Lord, I'm like Moses. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. I want to see your glory. I want to I be in your presence at that level, like Moses was, but I don't want to die. So what do I need to do for that? And I just left it at there. It's just like I had such a desire to be in the presence of God the Father and in his glory and be brought into the Holy of Holies because now that the veil is rent and we have access, we can do that. And I said, Lord, I want to be right there. I want that more than anything. And um, so I was a young mom. And I lived in Florida. We had beaches and swimming pools, and it was hot. And there was a certain garment, that, and it was, it was modest for what it was needed for. And I, and I loved it. You know, it was perfect, and it was good. And, and I looked, I was 20, so, you know, 20-year-old, they, they look good in anything, you know. So anyway, I love this. And, um, but when I would be out, I would be like, I felt like, you know, there's that correcting father again. I felt like his eyes were burning on me. And it was just like I would just run from one place to the other. And, and I could just feel it. And it's like something's wrong. I don't know what's wrong. Something's wrong. And I went into the house one day, and the Lord said, throw it away. And I was like, really? But this is perfect. He goes, throw it away. And at that moment, he was asking me to change 
the way that I dressed to please him. And I took it, and I remember throwing it away, and I thought, if I don't pour grease on it, I'll be tempted to get it out. So I threw the grease on it, and it was done. It was done. So I asked him, because, you know, the priest had to wear, cover their thighs. So I asked him what it would take, but I didn't know what was going to happen. I threw it away, and I went to prayer. Had no clue. And I'm telling you that I have never in my life from that day experienced what I experienced that day. And I remember I was in the floor and I was balled up. And the presence and the glory of the Lord filled the room where I was at. And I was even afraid to look up. I just had my head to the carpet. And it's like, what is this? And then in my mind, I saw the Lord in my mind and in my spiritual mind and thinking. And I saw him pick me up in the ball that I was in. Jesus. And he carried me to the throne room. And he sat me in front of a holy God. And I'm telling you, I wish that I would have had a recorder. That's all I can remember. Because the praise that started coming out of me was a praise that I've never said before and since that day. And it was like, Holy Spirit, that's perfect. I wish I had a recorder because I was worshiping God in his glory and in his throne room. Because I didn't treat something holy, holy, holy as common. Sanctify. Come out from the world. Be separate, says the Lord. Touch not the unclean. Don't dress like the world. Don't act like the world. Don't do what they do. Because if you do, you love the world. The love of the Father is not in you. So he was calling me to holiness. And so then my best friend, she's probably going to see this. She's going to kill me. She, would, she was a barmaid. And she would get so upset because the pastor would say, and there's Dottie. And she was a barmaid, but look what God has done in her life. And she's like, why does he have to say that? <laughs> and she, oh my gosh, we were, we are to this day. She's my bestie. She's my best friend. We pray together. Our faith and our love and our passion for God is the same. She's my best friend. We have that connection. But when I was in the church, I was the older Christian, and I was, you know, she was learning, and, and I was discipling her. And she came in to church in a um, beautiful outfit, heels, hair done, makeup on point, beautiful. I thought, wow, she looks amazing. Look down. She's got a skirt to here in the holy place, in the house of the Lord. And um, I immediately knew about what I went through. It's like, she can't do that. I'm, I'm her teacher. I'm her disciple. Or I'm going to tell her. And I was kind of angry. She can't do that in the house of the Lord. She can't show her thighs. The priest died when they showed their thighs. And I said, I'm going to tell her. And, and as soon as I said that, the Lord said, no, you're not. Don't you say a word. He said, that's my place. I tell Put the pudding forth of the finger away. Deal bread to the hungry. Clothe the naked. And let people grow in grace. And I watched her. I watched her. I don't think she ever wore a skirt like that after that day. And I didn't say a word to her. Nothing. But he taught her, you know, we have to be, there's holiness. And, and I shared this, and, and then I'll be done. I shared this in, in first service. I have visions. I've had visions before, and all I can say is that there a picture, a movie starts playing in my mind when I'm praying. And I've only had a few, but, but I just call them movies, movies playing in my brain when I'm in prayer. But this happened. I was in prayer, and I was in Florida. So my brother was here. He was at the, the Oasis, youth pastor. And I had a dream that me and my brother were on the beach. And we were unearthing a treasure, ch a treasure chest. He got one in and I got the other. And we pulled it out. We uncovered it. We pulled it out. We put it on the beach. And we had found a treasure, a lost treasure. We found 
That's what restoration is. Finding a lost treasure. Something that has, was a treasure, but it was replaced with garbage, with filth. Carry forth the filth out of the holy place. And so the Lord spoke to me and he said, he said, that, you know what that chest is? Sanctification. And he said, you and your brother are going to bring it back to the church. Because we used to say we're saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, now I think we just went saved and Holy Ghost. <laughs> you know, but wow, the power that comes when we sanctify ourselves before an all-powerful God. It's not that he's all about himself. It's just that he is not the world. He's not filth. He's holy without holiness. No man will see God. We got to bring sanctification back and we got to cleanse ourselves. We can't look like the world, smell like the world, talk like the world, get entertain ourselves with the world. I hate language. I hate it, hate it, hate it. That's why we got vet angel. Takes the language out. But I cringe. I cannot stand to hear someone use the name of my Lord as a curse word. And I will not entertain myself with it. And these people will say, well, it doesn't bother me. I hear that at work. And I'm like, well, now that you're in your home and you're putting the movie on, you don't hear that. It's your choice to hear someone curse the name of God. The one who, if you didn't wear britches, you would die. You know? Sanctification. Restoration. Bring back to the house what we have lost. Sanctify yourselves. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Give your, Do your first works over. Everyone stand. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Thank you, God. Do in your house what you desire, God. Holy, holy, holy. Oh, we need you, God. Let your train fill the temple. Lord, we're laying the foundation just like they did in the book of Ezra. We're, la we're laying a new foundation. Do you know? I love this because I kept thinking, what is that about? What is it about that when they laid the foundation that the old men weeped? And the young men rejoiced. And it was like, I know that the old men thought that Solomon's temple was greater and more grand. But the young people were excited because they never saw what Solomon's temple was. This is just the new temple. But whether new or old like the cart, it's what God appointed. So they are rejoicing. But the old people are weeping and said the weeping was so loud that you couldn't distinguish it from the cries of shout of joy. And it's like, what is that? What is that? You know, I don't want to be an old fogey. <laughs> I don't want to be not seeing the new thing. I don't want to dampen present mercies by my sorrow. Remember what's in the past. He said, I'll do a new thing. You know, that his new thing, they could come. You're at the piano. He's at the piano already. I will do a new thing. But there's then Ecclesiastes says there's no new thing under the sun. Everything's been done. So a new thing is an old thing that's being done again. So I'm with the young people. I'm going to rejoice. When the foundation of the temple was destroyed and now it's being rebuilt. Are you kidding me? I'm not going to cry about that. Matthew Henry said it would have been, their crying would have been some, meant something had they repented of the things they did that caused the destruction of the other temple, then their crying would have been made some sense. But he said that the latter would be greater than the former. That's where the pastor was trying to get the words of, it's better. Restorate, when, he, when he does a restoration work, it's better than it was. He brings it back to the original state because the latter will be greater than the former. We're in the latter we're in the best day ever. We're in the coming of the Lord. Let's make the bride ready. No more spot or blemish on, 
on her white gown. Let's clean it up. Let's carry forth the filth out of the holy place. Man's ideas. I told my Illuminate leaders, I said, we don't need good ideas. Church is full of God, good ideas. We need God ideas. Because he's specific about what he wants and how he wants it. And I want to fight to get it for him. Lord Jesus, let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Lord God, have your way in this house. We love you. We praise you. We adore you. There is none like you. Lord, I love you. And I thank you for your presence that has been in this house. And during the singing, Lord, when you came into the house, I acknowledged your presence and I felt it. And, and Lord, I don't want to take that for granted. But I thank you for showing up today and blessing us. Now let us bless you with our lives, with our consecration, being crucified with Christ, being willing to suffer for the cause of the Christ so that the power of the cross can work on this planet before you come. In the name of Jesus, we pray. We love you. We love you, Lord. I, I love you and I praise you. Go with everyone and bless this word and let it be a seed now that begins to grow into a big tree. Make it, Lord, accomplish what you desire as it goes out. And I will not fail to give you the praise and the honor and all the glory. I love you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.